Well, that that had to be uh, the moment beyond the fold of the girls. And it had to be the moment of moments because, and you know, it's interesting, I was pastoring in Birmingham. And I had planned to go to Memphis, but there was a meeting in Tennessee, Nashville, and the bishop called me, the bishop with whom I had worked, and asked me to come to that meeting. So I went, and I was going back to Birmingham and then preaching and go to Memphis. So I went, I was going to drive, and I got downtown in my car and decided to get on the train. Trains were running good in Hummingbird and the Pan American. So I parked at the station lot, got on the train, went to Nashville, had the meeting, got on. I don't remember, Pam was going up and Hummingbird coming back, I don't remember which. Came back on the train. I didn't even tell my wife I was on the train, but she called me in Nashville and they told her I had gotten on the train going back to Birmingham. So she met me at the station. Martin was shot while I was on the train between Nashville and Birmingham, so I didn't know it until I got to Birmingham and saw her and the children standing on the platform. And I knew something terrible had happened. I could see it in her eyes. Um, they had all been crying. And, and uh, the kids and my wife. And I said, what is it? And she choked. And she said, Martin has been shot. And he's dead. And well, we had another sobbing session at the railroad station. And she said, the radio and TV folks have been calling. They want you to try to say something to calm the city. So I went and called Coretta. And I didn't get Coretta. They had taken her somewhere. I talked to Daddy King. And then went on the radio and TV stations in Birmingham to try to keep calm. And how, was, well, how do you figure out what to say at a time like that? Well, that's why it's important. You know, God moves in mysterious ways, his wonders to perform. He put leadership positions in preachers, pastors, who had all their lives comforted people, who lost loved ones. And so you, you pull on that experience. You pull on that faith in a God who is a God, Lord of life and death. And so you say to people that we thank God for Martin, and in his memory, don't desecrate his ministry. Don't do anything that he wouldn't want us to do. He was a nonviolent leader. Let us not resort to violence in the name of the nonviolent prince of peace and so forth. And that's what you try. You you help some. You couldn't stop at all. There were people who didn't who didn't care about the spirituality question. They wanted to strike out. And they did. But thank God it wasn't as bad as it might have been. Could you understand their anger? Oh, of course. I, I wanted to do the same thing. I wanted to strike out. A uh, flash of anger hit me when she told me. At the same time, the sadness. And you're torn between your emotions. You feel like you're being torn apart. You want to stand on the rooftop and say, this is what we told you when you, when you were hateful and when you were oppressive and this is where violence leads. You've destroyed a nonviolent man. And on the other hand you want to say uh, we have to honor his leadership and take the high road and know that an eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, leave us all blind and come in our food. <laughs> so it's it's a it's a terrible challenge, but that's a price of of leadership. It's not a it's not an easy road. It's not a a task that you get bouquets every weekend for. You probably get more brickbats than bouquets. But it's a tough job. I think that's what Martin would have wanted us to do. To say be calm and don't get don't get mad, get smart. Let's register to vote. Let's keep the movement alive. Let's keep pushing and fighting for what we know to be right. That's the way you remember Martin. That's what disturbed me now sometime about the birthday celebration is that we get so wrapped up in sentimentality that we forget movement. Martin was about movement. You folks with these powerful cameras and, and tubes, you'd like to show him always saying, I have a dream. But he wasn't just a dreamer. He was a doer. 
He was a crusader. He was a nonviolent, radical revolutionary. And sometime he ought to show him saying, uh, he who lives by the sword will perish by the sword. Sometime we ought to see him saying, uh, uh, the wages of sin is death. Whether that sin is crushing other human beings or stealing uh, bread from the mouths of the poor by a system or by a gun. It's the wages of sin is death. Show him saying that neither capitalism nor communism holds the answer ultimately for man's well-being. Capitalism is wrong because it uh, uh, makes people servants of the dollar. And communism is wrong because it makes the people servants of the state. When both the state and the dollar should be servants of the people. So that, you know, you that that's your challenge. Why do you think it is that that we as a nation want to sentimentalize him and and sort of um, mellow out what were really revolutionary ideas and and sayings? He got into a lot of hot water. Cost him his life. Wasn't just the bus in Montgomery. It wasn't just who rode, who owned it. You know, it was the system. And when he started the Poor People's Campaign to talk about reordering priorities, you were beginning to challenge the powers that be, the powers that want to control oil in, in the Middle East, the powers that want to, uh, 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 to uh, give tax cuts to the wealthy and uh, pity pat to the poor. Uh, when you challenge those powers, you you're on dangerous ground. And we don't we don't we don't show him in that light, but we don't want to deal with that message. We don't we don't want to deal with that with that part of, the, of of social economic change. We want the sentiment, but sometimes sentiment can become an impediment to movement, and we have to we 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 want to resurrect the messenger. And keep the message buried. And that's what I think is wrong with our posture toward Martin and his birthday. You can't, you can't uh, uh, celebrate the missionary and ignore the mission. Everybody who's at one iota above the imbecilic level knows that James L. Ray didn't have sense enough money enough, brains enough, courage enough, anything enough to plan and scheme and conspire to kill Martin by himself. Now, he may not even have pulled the trigger. I don't really care. It isn't important to me. I, I have some differences with Dexter over this issue. I think he was involved. I don't think he knew anybody else. I think they kept their identity secret, but he followed orders, and he knew he was involved because he, he shattered, he, he stalked Martin. Uh, when Martin came by my house in in uh, March of Birmingham, when I was in, uh, we found out later James O'Reilly was in town. I mean, we were getting ready to go to Memphis. So he stalked him. So I think he knew, but, but that he was a mastermind, that's the biggest joke. I mean, Red Skelton couldn't come up with a joke like that. Uh, so that I think what I really earned them, urged them to do was there was a fellow who owned a restaurant uh, over the rooming house, next to the rooming house, who died recently. He he was willing to confess his role and name names, but they wouldn't give him, uh, what do you call it, immunity. They wouldn't give him immunity and because the city of Memphis was afraid to give it to him. Because the city, the hands of the city members are not clean on this issue. Because we heard radio broadcasts sending a little white Mustang out of the city by east, out by the west, out by the north, all at the same time. All kind of, we had firemen shipped it from station to station and police assignments, all that. The city of Memphis does not have clean hands in this. So what do you, what do you think happened? How, how did Martin Luther King come to be shot? Well, I think, first of all, when he challenged the economic system of this country, when he put on the agenda 
the fact that there was a systemic inequity. He sealed his faith. They had to kill him. He was becoming too powerful, becoming too organized. Now they used stuff like they're going to have riots in the streets because he's pulling the people together. They feared the threat of a nonviolent, massive movement that was gaining ground among whites as well as blacks and Hispanics and others. And so they conspired to kill him. I believe someone high in government was involved. Federal government? Yes. Yes. I don't think uh, uh, the FBI published and the media published the ad room number. And to Lorraine, and I know the FBI gave it to him. People didn't have anybody down there spying, but the FBI knew his every move. And 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 James L. Ray couldn't have stalked. I don't put it past Hoover. Hoover hated him. Hoover called him the biggest liar in the world. And Hoover tried all kinds of things. Hoover sent a his people sent a tape to Coretta, which Andy says in his book was taped the night before the. March on what he's wrong. It was taped the night before our trial on the libel case in 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 Washington, uh, in which and they sent it back in which they had people imitating voices, creating a sore orgy, and I was there. And I know there was no orgy, and and but that was part of and and they sent Martin a note saying if you don't kill yourself in a certain few days we're gonna reveal this. So we sent a word but reveal it, reveal it. And Martin called me in Birmingham and said, Joe, Coretta got a tape, I think you ought to hear. Said, I heard somebody call your name on the tape. And, uh, and, and my voice is on the tape and uh, uh, teasing Ralph and so forth and so on. And I got all over here and so forth and so on. But, but that was the kind of viciousness that the FBI under J. Edgar Hoover perpetrated. So I don't put past that they weren't a part of some conspiracy to, now I don't think Lyndon Johnson knew anything about it. I don't think that, but I think somebody high in government did. And I think some people in Memphis and in Tennessee were involved. I think some people in the underworld were involved. Some people in the corporate world were involved. I wish I knew the details. I don't. We may never. And so you felt that with a new trial for James R. Ray that that this would Everything come out. It could come people out whom we knew, uh, learned since Ray's confession. They'd been involved. Could have subpoenaed them. Had them under oath in the trial. They wouldn't even, and even if it didn't let Ray, they wouldn't give this man immunity. Is that what you call it, immunity? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. If they've given him immunity. He was willing to talk. He's dead now. So I don't know if we'll ever know. But nobody. I, it would take God Almighty Himself. I'm not sure you could just send Jesus. He may have to come Himself and tell me James already did that all by Himself before I believe it. And then I said, Lord, let me feel the Jesus come let me feel the whole. <laughs> I'd be like Thomas. You know, James already couldn't do it by Himself. There had to be some kind of conspiracy.